all this time, I'm kind of like really trying to grow in evangelism. I mean, I'm doing, when we talk about broad gospel seed sowing, it was a very, very, very intense season in which I saw zero fruit, zero. And I'm like, God, this is not, this is not right. Either the gospel is the power of God for salvation or it's not. And I start seeing what's going on. And the Lord starts showing me these, the connection between proclamation and demonstration. And so we just, that was when we started praying for people. And then we start, I mean, the first person we saw healed, uh, was healed of, his dad was healed of cancer. And then, you know, that was what, you know, kind of led us to Berlin. Welcome back to the H3X podcast. My name is Mark Gehring, and together with your host, Dave Miller, we explore the head, the heart, and the hands of the Multiplying Church and her leaders. And today, we're sitting down with David Campbell, who is a missionary to Berlin, and at this uh, stage of life in Texas, but on his way back overseas. And during that that stage of time, he worked with immigrants in Berlin. We're going to hear all about that, but uh, want to connect with David today, hear his story, and learn a little bit about uh, uh, how God brought him to the, the place that he is in theologically and just in practice and doing the stuff. So, David, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, I would love for you to just start out by just sharing some of your story with us. Um, you've got a story that I think will connect with a lot of the people that listen to our podcast here uh, in terms of just where you've come from and where God's brought you to now. So, can you just take yeah. us back to the beginning for you um, and tell some of your story? Yeah, so I was uh, I was born at a really early age, um, but no, I uh, I won't go back that far. Good, um, we, yeah. we 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 don't need a curious case of Benjamin Day, so that's that's plus. Yeah, yeah, no, I I grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist uh, background, really. Uh, you know, like the the background was that the the gifts of the spirit have absolutely ceased. Not necessarily that we just don't talk about them, but that they actually have ceased. Um, and then, you know, so I I went along believing that. I grew up believing that. Really walked away from the Lord and um, wrecked my life and a lot of other lives. Uh, you know, through my um, late teen years, early adult years, and, you know, just really found myself at a place where I'm like, okay, there's, there's got to be something more to this. And I, I really, I ran back to church, if you will, because it was a safer life. That was, that was kind of my, my reasoning. And, um, and I remember, um, uh, I don't know if you guys uh, remember this, maybe from the uh, SBC background, there was a, a man by the name of T.W. Hunt uh, that wrote a book called, um, I think it's called The Mind of Christ. Yeah. And I'm, I met him and I just like, he was an old, old, old man. And I was uh, just so enamored. Like this guy knows Jesus at a way that I can't comprehend. And I just went like, went to him and I was like, I want to know the Lord like you do. And he, his response was really interesting. He said, no, you don't. He said, "If you have no idea what this cost me. You have no idea what this is going to cost you. And I was like, I just remember laying in, in bed that night, just like, okay, Lord, I think, I'm, I think I want to follow you like that guy does. And I mean, it was a systematic de-destroying uh, <laughs> of my life. Everything gets pulled out and and really, I was, uh, I thought that there were two places that, you know, that you could be, you could either be a pastor or you could be a missionary. And I didn't want to be either of those. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I was like, okay, Lord, whatever, whatever you want. And I remember looking at Matthew 28, um, 18 to 20, he says, uh, teaching them to obey all things I've commanded you. And I thought, let, let me grab my Bible and I'm going to find an imperative command. Um, and it, you know, I, I saw that, that thing of like, would you ever, like, I, I'm praying, God, send out workers in the harps, send them out. And, and he changed that prayer on me uh, to 
would you ever consider sending me out? Um, and in this time, I was, um, I, I was telling the Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. Um, I just want to know it's you. I really am interested to know, is it you? If it's, if I know it's you, the language I would use to the Lord is I'll lower my head, run through the brick wall for you. I just got to know it's you. And um, man, he, um, I began just hungering so, so much to hear God speak. And I grew up like in my tradition, like you, if you want to hear God speak, you read the Bible. And if you want to hear God speak out loud, you read the Bible out loud. That, I mean, I fully believe that. I fully embraced it. So I stripped everything out of my life. Uh, no, uh, like there was nothing other than my family and the, and the Bible that, that I had. And I, I was, uh, I did this Bible reading plan called Grant Horner Bible Reading System. It's uh, 10 chapters a day. I did that for about seven years. And I am just desperate. Like, Lord, what, what's it going to take? Like, I don't understand. Like, why can't I grow? And I'm, I was, uh, I'd spent my professional career uh, as a, a business analytics software for healthcare, for hospitals. And, and uh, I was sitting at my desk and I pushed myself back. And I just look up and I'm like, Lord, what is keeping me from growing? What is it? And I like, I wasn't expecting a word or anything like that. And I, I hear two words, religious spirit. And when that happened, I started seeing my life going backwards. I saw every sermon I'd listened to. I saw every book I'd read. I'd, I saw everything my uh, family, my, uh, you know, my cultural influences, every part of it was chains that were around me to where I was before I was even conceived. I was already a ball of chains. You couldn't even see that. You couldn't see who I was. It was a ball of chains. And all I could muster in that moment was Jesus help me. And I saw these hands just start breaking, snapping off chains. And I have no idea how long this time was. But at the end of that, there were things that I could freely accept that I would have fought you to the death over before. I mean, I would have literally fought you to the death over. Like all the way down to even how you approach Muslims. Like the whole contextualization debate and all this kind of stuff. There were things I could, I could suddenly accept. I could suddenly see it. There were things I could read in the Bible that I could see that's always been there, but I couldn't see it. And um, and it was kind of in that that season, there was a guy that um, I got an email, just a, a random email from a guy that said, hey, our team has been praying. Um, we feel like you and your family are supposed to lead a movement of the gospel that's going to start in Berlin. It's going to start with Muslim immigrants. It's going to begin jumping borders and flowing to the nation. We're like, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what he's talking about, but man, I just kind of ignored him for a long time. And I'm, I'm going through um, uh, perspectives on the world Christian movement. And uh, in that, I was introduced to uh, T for T, uh, the T for T book. And um, man, I was like, that's what I want to be a part of. Um, that's, man, I really want to be a part of that. And I was just asking the Lord, like, could I be a part of something like that? And after months and months and months, I, I'm asking the Lord, could I be a part of this, of something like that? And he sent me, or the Lord directed me and said, go back to your email from that guy. I went and looked at it. I looked at it and it was like all there. It was, it was the same thing. It was everything that I had been reading about. So I called him up and I'm like, Hey, I'd love to join your, you know, my wife and I would love to join your team. If the position's still available. And he's like, yeah, the position's available. There is no team. You have to build the team. And, um, I was like, <laughs> 
okay. Like, I just, I don't get it. <laughs> but, um, in the, you know, so all this time, I'm kind of like really trying to grow in evangelism. I mean, I'm doing, when we talk about broad gospel seed sowing, it was a very, very, very intense season in which I saw zero fruit, zero. Like what, like it got to where I was, I was knocking on doors and then it was not only knocking on doors, there was a truck stop not far from here. And every night, 300 trucks are parked there. And so I'm going to go and I'm going to share the gospel with as many people as I can every night, as much as I can. I saw nothing. I saw zero people come to Christ. And I'm like, God, this is not, this is not right. Either the gospel's the power of God for salvation or it's not. And I start seeing what's going on. And the Lord starts showing me these, the connection between proclamation and demonstration. It, and it was always there. It was always there. I'm like, I, how do I do this? And so we just, that was when we started praying for people. And then we start, I mean, the first person we saw healed, uh, was healed of, his dad was healed of cancer. Um, and that just kind of sparked all this stuff. We saw, uh, people with reproductive issues healed. We, we began to, to see wild stuff here, here in Texas. And then, you know, that was what, you know, kind of led us to Berlin. And, um, I mean, not to throw anybody under the bus, but man, when we got to Berlin, no one wanted to work with us. Like no one knew us. We don't know who you guys are. You're not part of our organization. You don't, you're not part of our church. Like we're not going to have anything to do with you. And I'm, I'm struggling with the Lord. What do we do? What do we do? We, you called us here. We're here. And the only thing we need to do, like when the refugees started coming in, there's a, there's a line of people lined up for the, the, um, the medical tent. We go to the middle of that line. And we say, hey, guys, we follow Jesus. Is there anybody here that needs healing? And just miracles began to break out. And people were getting healed. Eyesight was getting healed. Uh, people were, like, it was a, like, things were happening so fast that we just couldn't, we couldn't keep up. And, you know, it kind of morphed into, uh, at there for a two-year period, or close to a two-year period, we were, we we're baptizing close, like six days a week. Like we kept waiters in the back of our van and we would baptize <laughs> in, the, in the, uh, the canal. And um, like, yeah, and like we wanted to get to reproduction. We wanted to get into like s s more of these multiplication, um, uh, discipleship multiplication. And we couldn't keep up. Like that was, that was the... The brutal facts of it all we we couldn't keep up with what god was doing and uh and it was you know i'd love to say that that was a, a great season but it was difficult to kind of navigate that and to, to kind of build a team that was going to work around us and work with us and and all that stuff and it was a, it was a challenge but uh, man the lord has been faithful throughout every season you, one of the things, I mean, there's there's a lot in there of just your background and how God began to lead you. I love yeah. that. I kind of hear this tension in what you're sharing around. Um, I know you, I, I heard you share in another podcast of God said, go, and then he's going to shake out the path as you right. uh, just respond to the go. And so right. there's this tension I even hear in what, in what drove you into this place of missions of you know what? It says in the Bible to pray and I'm going to start praying for God to raise up workers. But then also yep. he he brings people with specific prophetic words that lead. Can you yep. talk a little bit about that, that tension in your own journey and how you wrestled that out? Cause I think there's a lot of people who listen to this and process yeah. this of how do I hear a calling from God and how do we begin to step into this mission? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. The, uh, my wife and I really heard that from the Lord kind of on the same day. We, we heard that out of Genesis 12, uh, one, where uh, like we were literally in two different parts of the city. We had been praying about where we're going to go. Cause, cause you know, Hey, if, if you're wanting to be a missionary, you're wanting to go, your, your mindset is always where and who, 
Like, where am I going to go? Who am I going to minister to? And sometimes the Lord, I think that the Lord does want to clarify that, but ultimately we're called to him. We're called to him. Let's go follow him. He's going to lead us. And we either believe that or we don't. And so when we, we both heard that, it was like he highlighted those verses on the same day at the same time. And he said, go to the place that I'm going to show you. And it really resonated with us that we move and he shapes the path. And that's, and, and so I, uh, I run into a lot of young people right now that they're, they're in the process of mobilizing, you know, they're, they're going through the training, they're doing all these things. And they're like, man, I'm just waiting on the Lord to kind of show me where, where am I going to go? And I'm not going to go anywhere until he says, this is where you're going to go. And, and I think the Lord's often saying, I'm not actually going to speak anything until you actually start moving. And, you know, he's, he's omniscient. He can, he can outweigh us. Like he's way bigger than we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like that statement. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, and, that's, I mean, and that's really our journey. This, I mean, starting this summer, we feel like the Lord has said, Hey, you're going to go and I'm going to shake it out. We, we think we're going to, we know where we're going, uh, and what we're going to be doing. Uh, but we've got to hold that pretty loosely. I mean, I hear that theme throughout all of what you're sharing, David, over and over again. God's got you in this place of, I mean, that that's one of the big themes I hear in, in what you're saying is just this obedience. You're going to obey yeah. what God puts in front of you, and then he unfolds more. So yeah. it's not like you're saying, God put this great gift for healing on my life, or he did all this yeah. kind of stuff. It's, nope, you just, you went out, and you started sharing, and you, you went, yeah. and then you hit this roadblock, and you're saying, God, what do I do? demonstration yeah. okay i'm gonna pray and you just you're just stepping out to do it uh can you yeah. speak a little more to that just just obeying with what's right in front of you yeah i i mean it's really interesting especially for us that want to you want to hear the lord but you've kind of come from a more conservative evangelical background um there's a tendency to really kind of elevate this is what other people are doing or this is what people are saying Right. Um, and you look at what God is telling you to do, and it, it might not make sense. Right. It might not make sense in the context of what everyone else is doing. So, uh, you know, God has given my family and I a heart for not just unreached people groups, but Muslim unreached people groups. So, it's, well, so let's just be really clear on that. But if we understand that God has put, it's his heart to reach every tribe, tongue, and nation. All I've got to do is obey that first step. Now, he may tell me to go across the street and go to the mailbox right now. And you walk to the mailbox and you meet somebody and you share the gospel with them. And you, you minister to them and they get lit up for Jesus. And then they go somewhere and then they meet someone and then they meet someone and then suddenly that's connected to reaching the nations right like all i got to do is be obedient i can just i trust him i know what he's saying i know what is on his heart and all i've got to do is be obedient to what he says to do right now at this time and not think too far through it like it's the hardest part getting out of my own head and then I think the other the other piece of that I just hear in your story um, is even then you 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 fast forward God gives you this this amazing prophetic word about movements yeah. from Berlin through immigrants but then you get there and <laughs> nobody wants to work with you and so right. you could just well we're gonna wait around and just wait for this to start no you 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 actually begin to look for like where can we jump in and start right. responding to this I think there's some. Yeah. Some keys even there of just we we can hear God in these ways, but right. that that still means like we're gonna hit roadblocks and we just keep going and we put into right. practice what we know. Well, in that you know once we started moving forward, uh, we we wanted to really learn how to steward that prophetic word. Okay, someone gives you a prophetic word doesn't make sense and you're like, okay, what do I do with this? So I want to steward it. I'm gonna pray about it. I want to just. 
I want to speak it out. I'm going to remind the Lord for it. And I'm going to take opportunities to step into it if I can find them. Right. So uh, and then just but but also not take it too seriously if I run into a roadblock. Once we started moving forward, the Lord really began to clarify and actually give us visions of what this is going to look like. And two things that he showed us was um, wells, wells of revival and uh, fires of revival that are going to start like the fires are going to start little. And it's going to begin to spread. It's going to look insignificant. It can be stepped on, crushed out, uh, but that's okay. Start a lot of little fires. They're going to burn. Uh, the other thing was, and this was where it really made sense, was was the wells. Like it would begin to flow. And what happens is when when liquid is beginning to flow, it'll run into a barrier and it'll rise over. It'll go around all this stuff. So knowing like, what's he trying to do and just recognize here's a barrier, but that's not going to stop me. It can't stop me. I'm going to hop in and just say, um, coming from, you know, my background, I'm resonating big time with what you're saying, just because your journey is very similar in the way that the Lord kind of worked on my, um, you know, I came from a cessationist background. I was SBC in my background. And so you, yeah. you had made mention your indie fundy, which means you don't just talk about it, but you, you speak openly about how wrong it is. And I'm SBC. Yeah. So we kind of just stay quiet. Like you mentioned, you just kind of stay quiet about those things. But yeah. one of the things that I found in my life is that the Lord has always spoken to me in ways that were a little bit more clear than what sometimes other people understood. Mm -hmm. um, and I struggled a lot. So I resonate, right? Because you're like, what do I do with this? Right. And as, as people who are listening that are going to come from that background, um, you're going to hear, I'm speaking to them real quick. You're going to, because I just want to help clarify a couple of things that I, have helped me in my thinking and just yeah. my trust in this is that when you hear things like the well or the fire, I think a lot of times we treat what you describe as a prophetic word as like, this is this Old Testament uh, yeah. future telling promise yeah. that is that is unchangeable. Um, and that, you know, like we're talking like Isaiah 53 prophecies of the servant uh, who's going to die and there, there's nothing that can be done differently about it. But also when we look at New Testament, what we see is in the same way, I think in the Old Testament, when we hear these words, the first thing that someone who comes from my background or your background thinks is, well, if God said it, then we must execute it precisely, exactly, and it's now up to us. And we, we treat it as if um, yeah. we treat the word of yeah. God as if God tells us something and then it's our job to disconnect from him, go accomplish the task and then come back and tell him whenever we finished it. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. one of the struggles yeah. that happens when we separate a, a relationship of listening to the spirit of God and we go, okay, the word of God, yes, God speaks through his word, but we treat it as if once we put the Bible down, that that disconnection is now broken. We have yeah. to go and execute whatever it is we heard God do. And then we have to come back to the written word in order to reestablish that relationship to get the next direction. Yeah. When you have that mindset, this type of talk is very difficult because oftentimes what I've found is, is that when God gives me something very specific, he's not giving me direct orders to disconnect from him to go accomplish and then come back. Amen. He's Amen. Giving me encouragement. He's giving me encouragement that says in this next season, the way this relationship is going to look and I need and when things get really tough and you remember the fire in the well because that, that's what yeah. you're going to have to understand is their fire in the well is what i'm doing now continue to walk with me so you can see how i'm going to pattern but if that's we right. think of it this very clear direct direction that we know exactly what god says then it doesn't become an encouragement at that point. It actually becomes a hindrance because then I feel like a failure all the time. So That's I just right. want to encourage people as you're listening to this, take these ideas and this relationship and the way that God is speaking to David. If I'm putting words in your mouth, correct me. But I just no, sense in great. my own life that this, this becomes a way in which God says, in this season, I need you to remember this idea so that you yeah. don't think I've forgotten about you. And it is God's way of just right. saying, keep faithful, because to me, it's pushing yeah. us towards obedience. Don't quit. Yeah. Just keep going. I'm up to something and I'm cluing you into enough of it to say, be encouraged. Keep being obedient. You're not crazy. Yes. Uh, and, and you did not put words in my mouth. I, I think that's absolutely correct. And 
And if I could kind of piggyback on that, one of the ways that we uh, we kind of, I mean, we're walking with a lot of people who wreck, who are struggling through that right now. Like, especially coming, sure. you know, a lot of people in this general area of the country, they're really struggling with that. And here's the way that we we tend to explain it. If you look back at the garden, when when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden and he created them adults right there. He created them like complete. But the problem is, is they didn't have prior knowledge of anything. Like in essence, they're a fresh slate. They have no prior knowledge. They don't have anything to draw from, any experiences to draw from, any background. They don't have anything to draw from. All they've got is there's a tree of life which we know that they had to be because they had to be removed from the garden so that they didn't eat of that tree and stay in that state forever. Okay. So here's what happens. They're in the garden. They have the option. I can walk daily with my father and say, I don't, you gave me a task to steward this creation and I don't know how to do it. I don't have any experience doing this. I don't know anybody else that's doing it. I don't know how to do it. Right. And he's like, that's okay. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you. You're going to, you're going to see this unfold. And that was what he was offering to them. But then Satan comes along and that was what the temptation was. We forget, like we look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil and we ram those two together and we, it doesn't make sense anymore, but it's the tree of knowledge of good and the tree of knowledge of evil, good and evil. It's the tree of knowledge. It's the thing that if I just knew the right thing to do, I could do it. And I don't need relationship. And that was what was the problem. It was knowledge divorced from relationship. And what God is calling us to do, like we can still, like as Bible believing Christians, we can still eat from that tree and we got to stop it. Like we've got to, We've got to go to our father and we've got to take this, this, this process of like, I'm reading the Bible, but I can't understand this apart from the Holy Spirit. I need you. You've got to show me. I'm going to mess this up and not take ourselves seriously. I'm going to make a mistake. I've got to run back to my father. Father, I, I, I didn't do this right. It didn't look like what I thought. What, what do you say about it? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Look, one more quick question on that in your story about how old were you whenever you were sitting there working on yeah. your job and you pushed away from your desk and you and, and God spoke to you in a way that kind of blew your mind up uh, about 35 mark I mean how long have we known each other now uh, what five six years yeah so, uh, five, gosh. Six years yeah COVID makes it uh, 20 years uh, that's what we always say <laughs> yeah um, yeah but but part of the reason why uh, David I just really uh, connect with this story is because that's what God used Mark to do in my life was uh, I finally met somebody who was gracious enough to not just slap me around, but be patient enough to say, yeah, um, yeah, I think this way. And then explain to me words that he was using and then taking time for me to work out going, okay, is this word mean this or that? And then, you know, going through all that stuff, but God brought Mark into my life to be like, okay, here's some things you can do with the ways that God speaks to you. That's not necessarily the way you were taught he can do. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I like, you know, I'll just out myself. Um, God gives me dreams a lot. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I have no idea what they're about. And sometimes they'll take 10 years before I'll figure out, Oh, I know exactly what that means, but I write them down, right. I keep them. Um, and then I just use them and just say, okay, Lord, when, if you want me to understand this, then either bring someone into my life. It's going to help me mm -hmm. in a conversation. They might not even know yeah. it or just show right. me, but I'll just put them in the hopper and they just become yeah. encouragements. And I know that yeah. God is doing something. So I don't mean to derail I, the conversation, but I just super encouraged by it. No, I think that's absolutely critical. And, and that's a, you know, when people are asking us, Hey, I really want to hear God speak. I, I think you just made a, a critical I don't know if you knew you were doing this or, or if it was intentional, but it's probably it's not. Re it's really good in that, um, you know, uh, the Bible says that, that the word of God goes out and it will not return to him void without accomplishing everything that it was sent forth for. 
Okay. So if people want to hear God speak, but they're not willing to do something about it or do something with it, you can guarantee you he will not speak to you because you're not going to do anything with it. That would mean his word would return to him void. So when you're writing it down and you're stewarding it, that is you saying, with what I have, I'm going to do everything I can with what I have. I'm not, if you want me to act on it, I'll act on it. If you want me to, to do something with it, I will. Yeah. But I'm going to write it down and at least I'm going to take an action step, take a, take a faith step and put it there. And, um, I think, I think doing it with, uh, with dreams that, that is uh, phenomenal. Our, we've, yeah, I just think it's so amazing. I got to ask a question here, David, and I love yeah. that we're taking just a lot of time to talk about this piece of your story. I want to get to more, but uh, this is this yeah. is really helpful. I just know from the different yeah. people who I've talked to that listen to this and the different kinds of questions people have out there, um, yeah. this is really helpful to, to to pull back the curtain on some of this. And yeah. I'm ever the practical guy in Dave and I's yeah. relationship. I always come back to the practical. Which is why like, I always send the dreams to you. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so David, I, I know there's a lot of other people out there that are listening to all of this and like, yes, yes, yes. And then they're like, yeah. I hear you say that idea of like, um, it, when God speaks something to us, we've got we've to do something with that and come back to that. But yeah. then the question for the people listening, or at least would be for me, is, but what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Like day to day, right. week to week, what does that look like? God gave me this prophetic word about uh, being a missionary in Berlin and working yeah. among yeah, immigrants yeah. That, that as an example. Or he said to you, as you're at the truck stop, it's the demonstration and the proclamation. What does that look like to steward that sure. in the day to day, the, the week to week for you? Are you talking about specifically how does a person learn to hear God or how do you learn to steward what you think you've heard? Let's talk about the stewardship. So he said something to you. How do you not just let yeah. that be a one moment thing? God yeah. will do that if he wants to do it. No, there's actually a participation on your end. What does that look like? Yeah, for you? yeah the first thing I'm going to do is, is write it down um, and then I'm going to begin to pray about it. Um, and, 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 and so I think all of us can kind of determine, like, there are like things we think we hear from God that have bigger consequences than others. You know, if he's saying, go, uh, go to the mailbox right now and, and I'll wait there, I'm going to send someone to you. Okay. Is that in the Bible? No. Do, uh, you know, uh, if it's not in the Bible and I go out there and I wait all day and nothing happens, then, okay, I chalk it up. Maybe I'm, I, I misheard, but I'm, I want to do, so basically I'm saying there's, there's rankings of, uh, of how serious that is, uh, what are, in terms of the consequences. Uh, now the way that I process through this, I look at, there's really four voices. Um, there's the voice of the world. Uh, there's, that means people speaking into you, what everyone else says. I can silence that voice by going and being alone in a room by myself or and just pulling out different uh, influences. Then there's the voice of my own flesh, my mind, my will, my emotions. We've been given authority over our flesh. And so I'm going to I'm going to speak to my flesh in Jesus name. You are going to submit to Jesus. You're not going to listen to anything else. I'm going to silence it. I'm like, Jesus, name, you're going to be, I'm going to command my mind to be silent, which was really interesting uh, revelation. There was this time when, man, my, my thoughts were just running all the time. And it was, it was so frustrating. And uh, it was like these images just, just flashing all the time. And uh, it's just in a moment, I just said, in Jesus name, stop. And it just goes, <laughs> it just stopped. And, uh, and it's like, okay, now I realize, I, like, hey, I actually, biblically, I do have authority over my own flesh to silence it. And so I'm going to take that authority and I'm going to command it, right? That God created the world. He spoke. There's something powerful in his words. Now there's the voice of evil. I also have that same authority. In Jesus' name, I'm going to silence the voice of the enemy. 
So if I've done those three, that really leaves only one left, and that's the voice of God. And if and I look at it as, and then I and then once I hear that, I'm going to say, it's it's going to come like out of as a thought, or maybe it comes as a vision, maybe it comes as a dream, but oftentimes it's just a little impression. Just so, it's something that you could easily push it away. And um, I'm going to take that and I'm going to say, would the devil want me to do this? Would the world want me to do this? Or would God want me to do this? If, if the devil would want me to do this, I'm probably going to, you know, or, or would my flesh want to do it, right? Like, would my flesh want me to go stand by the mailbox waiting on someone to come there? Oh, heck no. Like, there's no way my flesh would want that. <laughs> Like, so I can, I can pretty much guarantee that's not me. Or if I get the impression, I think I should go share the gospel with that person over there in the coffee shop. There's no way that the devil wants me to do that. There's nothing in my flesh that would want to do that. So I can be pretty convinced that the Lord wants me to do that. Now, if I, if it's a more serious, like a, like the consequences are more serious, like an international move quitting my job, uh, something of that nature. I'm going to go through those same processes and I'm going to submit that to people I trust. Other people that I know have a history of walking with the Lord, have a history of hearing him speak to them. They, they have like, I'm going to submit that to them and say, will you pray with me about this? What is your spirit bearing witness on with you on this? And, and even then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to let it ride a little bit. And I'm telling the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go. You tell me when, I'm going. I'm, I want to be like a dog on a chain. You let the chain go and I'm gone. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay only to the point that you tell me to stay. or you, you know. But, but what I've noticed that is your flesh, if it is your flesh, your flesh will always get tired. So you're praying about something and you're all hot and bothered about it. And then all of a sudden it begins to wane a little bit. Okay, well, maybe that's maybe that's my flesh. Maybe that's my own ambitions and stuff like that. But if it's from the Lord, you can't shake it. He doesn't get tired. Like he's just yeah. going, like it's just going to be there. It's going to be a burning. Like when I look at, at our calling to minister to Muslims, um, I mean, we're 10 or 12 years in right now. Like it's, and it, it, the burning desire, the burning passion hasn't waned at all. Like there's just no let up. And so I can be pretty confident that, man, that's the Lord. Cause I, there's no way I could do that on my own. Mark, this is this goes a lot with the conversations we've kind of had in the past as well, where we're talking about um, early discipleship or even believers who have been there for a long time, but really are just ignorant of the word because they don't spend time with it. David, one of the things that I'm hearing that is really just, I think, super helpful, and I'm really glad you're putting these pieces together for everybody who's hopping on this. The way in which you know the difference between those voices is that you have to go back to the pattern. And I've just listened to the word of God come out of your mouth over and over and over and over. And oftentimes in this conversation, I hear people go either or, oh, you're, you listen to God this way, or, oh, you're in the word of God. And, and there's a, there's a parallel in your conversation that I think is super helpful to point out. Really good. How do I know the voice of the devil? How do I know the voice of the flesh? How do I know the voice of the world? How do I know the voice of the Lord? And the answer is you mm -hmm. go to the original pattern and God has just repetitively over and over and over and over and over again revealed himself. And then he's been gracious yeah. enough to write down the story, to use his people throughout history. And then as we are, you, you were reading 10 chapters a day for seven years. And so <laughs> yeah. that transformation of your mind that was to Right. taking place as the spirit of God was just reworking your worldview, reworking the way that you think, reworking the patterns by the way that you see things. 
allows you to then in moments go, that's of God, that's not, that's the devil, that's my flesh. And the reason you know that is because the Bible has said, this is what your flesh looks like. This is what evil looks like. I can't know the difference between good and evil unless God tells me that relationship that you've had is what has given you that clarity over the years. And Mark, I, I know we're interviewing and talking with David, but I'd like for you to jump in and just even talk about some of the things that you and I have kicked around about how important the word of God is in quantity for new believers mm-hmm. as we teach them and want them to have this style of relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I could share it briefly. Um, uh, what I, I, what I love about what you shared, David, is this theme in your story about God saying go, and then he'll shake out the path. The path will be shaped in front of you. And I think a lot of the time, uh, I run into to people who are not going because they want the whole path to be shaped out. They want this all to be right. just laid out in front of them. And so a lot of what I would say is the theme of this part of your story and our conversation today is how does that path get shaped out? And yeah. so when you talk about that, Dave, of the role of the word of God and all of that, um, to me, it becomes this framework. It's a It's a grid through which I can filter for what does the voice of, because when we're talking about the voice of God, the voice of God sounds like something. It sounds like his character within the story and then shaped by the, my experiences in the past of hearing his voice and the ways he speak, spoken. And so the word of God, it's absolutely essential because it, it forms my understanding at a heart level, at a mind level of how to recognize those other three sources you're talking about. So if yeah. I don't have what that, that like you talked about 10 years of all those, the chapters a day, my worldview is not shaped. My, my, my framework is not shaped to be able to recognize what is that the character of a good shepherd? Um, or is that not John 10? Um, and then being able to say, does that, does that fit into the narrative of the story of what I know about God? And I know about what he speaks and what he's doing. Like you're saying like, Hey, go over here and share with this person that fits pretty clearly into this story of the priesthood yeah. of the believer, all the way back to Exodus, yeah. to the book of Revelation. There's this call of God's people to be participating in a part of the story that he's unfolding. And so the word of God, it is the, it's the framework through which yeah. we can even have this conversation yeah. about what does the prophetic word look like in the New Testament? And how does, how does that work as David and Carrie hear God speaking about going to Berlin? Um, it, it fits within that framework of, yeah. where we're at in the story in God's word. Yeah, there it just never like I don't think you ever get to a place where the Bible is irrelevant uh to the conversation. Um I I think that a lot of people because of what they've been taught are believe that people who have a charismatic bent is, are less biblically literate than other people and I love, yeah. I love to challenge that. I mean, I, that is actually one of my favorite things to do because that was my bent for a long time. I thought someone who's charismatic, they don't know the Bible. Um, and, um, and you know, it's like, yeah, we're, it, it's, you just never outgrow it. You never out, like a, a friend of mine uh, challenged me December 31st. He's like, Hey, I'm doing this. 30 days through the whole Bible. And uh, I was like, okay, let's, you know, let's do that. And, um, you know, of course, using you, you version and having it read to you and, and all that, sure. I was able to get through it in 15 days. And I was like, this was, it was so life-giving. And, and to Dave's point, he said this over and over again, as we've just had different conversations around this subject. And that's speaking to what you're saying, Dave, about large chunks of scripture um, we are, there's just this, it just continues to bring me back to this place of awe and worship of the Lord yeah. that the story is unfolding and we get to be characters in the story and right. by digesting right. large chunks of scripture, it, it brings us into this 30,000 foot view of what is this grand narrative story that we're in that Jesus is at the center of, but somehow we've been brought in as a piece of this story. And so all of that then shapes how we hear God in the midst of that. So, oh yeah. And there's so many more nuggets that we can keep tossing in. I mean, in the sense that David, you're saying you're submitting those larger consequential decisions to the community and you're allowing the community to speak back to you to make sure that you've got clarity on what you're saying. And 
Um, right. The fact that you're you're explaining that there's a lot of grace in the process of this because you recognize that I fail often and really often. finding the clarity. Um, and and then this is before we even hit record. You said I don't like being called a practitioner. We all just laughed. I'm like, well, we're all practicing, right? So this is a great example of <laughs> just practicing. Even this past Sunday, we were in Acts 21 as a church, and you know we get to that passage where everybody through the Spirit is telling Paul, "Don't go to Jerusalem." And Paul is saying in Acts 20, "I'm constrained by the Spirit. I have to go." And then Agabus shows up and you know binds yeah. his hands, and and he's saying, "Don't do this." And Paul goes don't care. I'm going anyway. And so you've got this tension going on in Acts 21 that, you know, our 20 somethings in the church just really wrestled with where they're like, the spirit yeah. seems to be saying, don't go. And Paul's saying, spirit says, how should I go? And I think that's just a great tension we see in the scripture of what it yeah. looks like for the community to wrestle through. What is God telling us? Even though everybody knew what was going to happen, how they responded to what they knew was going to happen was up for grabs yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And there are going to be times when you're, you're wanting to be obedient and you're going to be alone. Like you want to follow the Lord, like, like Paul in, in, in that particular scenario. I mean, the guy's getting a prophetic word. It is a real, and it's legit. It's like, he's saying this is what's going to happen. It's his interpretation of what to do about it or his application. I should say application right. of what to do with that. That was off. Yeah. So he heard correctly and 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 Paul's like, Hey, you know, you're weeping and breaking my heart. What are you doing? You know, knock this it is off. Such a great conversation, great distinction, so many nuggets. Mark, this is good. <laughs> this is good. This is good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so you David just for sharing your wisdom. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah.